relationships. All right, so I'm going to be like a lecturer here. Names few relationships that you have in your daily life, right? So life is filled with a lot of relationships, right? We all, from the birth until the moment we die, we all are, we all go through some relationships in life. Let me name few. Occupational relationships, right? Occupational relationships are more of, you know, you go to your work, we work with your bosses, you work with your supervisors, your employees, your co-workers, uh, your customers, your clerks. So you have occupational relationships in your life. And you have your neighborhood relationships, right? Neighborhood relationships is more of a, you know, your domain, your neighborhoods where you cross across the street, across, around the corner, uh, down at the supermarket, down at a workstation or a gas station, your dress up, your tailor, your teacher, your receptionist, right? These are more of a neighborhood relationships or neighborhood relationships. A professional relationship where you go to your doctor, your dentist, your lawyer, your realtor, your accountant, your mechanic, your USPS store, you, you know, your FedEx store. So the more of a, uh, you know, professional relationships. We all have friends in life. Is there anybody who doesn't have a friend here? I would like to talk to you if you don't have a friend. Um, but we all have, uh, you know, different types of relationships. No man is in, in an island wherein you don't have somebody to talk to, somebody to, uh, you know, uh, approach to. And also we have family relationships, right? We have brothers, sisters, core brothers, co sisters, brother in law, sister in law, mother in law, daughter in law. Everything that you name, we have it, right? But these are all like, you know, more of a family relationships. The potentials of relationships is, sometimes you all could echo with me on this, uh, a relationship with other people bring us pleasure as well as pain. Do you all agree? Right? They bring us pleasure, they bring us um, pain. And they also make us feel better, and they also make us feel bitter. Right? Your relationship, you know, the name, I've, uh, you know, uh, the, some of the examples I went through, they make us um, feel better sometimes, and they make us feel bitter sometimes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we are blessed with these relationships, and most of the times we are bothered with these relationships. If you have a, a, a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law relationship, there's always friction in that. No matter how, how godly we are, there's something that will always come. So relationships are, are better or bitter. Relationships are sometimes they bring blessing, they bother us in our life, and they make us happy, they made us sad, they make us mad, they make us frustrated, they make us go to the bookshelves and buy all sorts of books. But the most significant part of our life is um, controlled by a relationship. Imagine a day where you have a tuck with your wife or with your boss or your, or your son or your mother-in-law or your father-in-law. How does your mood look like? Will you be happy that day? I don't think so, right? We'll have our head down and then... Um, we'll, we'll be feeling uh, frustrated and we'll be feeling depressed and we don't want to talk, we want to go in a silo or if person is more of a tea guy, he'll make sure he's caffeinated. And uh, you know, sometimes you know, uh, uh, the more extremes of it is, um, you know, people go to bookshelves to find relieving or you know, you know, uh, uh, books where you can soothe them and sometimes they, um, you know, these relationships would be so painful that you might end up taking new pills. And for the extreme of the extremists, you might end up in a bottle or an or a, or a injection. So these relationships are created, right? These are created with God. How? When he created Adam and Eve, God put a relationship between them. When he created Cain and Abel, God created a, a relationship. First with God and then with all the other people we have in our life. So when we have a relationship, the worst pain in life is not a broken body, but a broken relationship. Let me repeat that for you. The worst pain a mankind could ever experience in his life is not a broken body. You might have your lip broken, you might have your hand uh, broken, but it's a broken heart that is actually is the most painful thing. When we are rejected, when we are betrayed, we are, we are um, criticized, we are falsely accused, when we are overlooked, we are ignored, unresolved, unappreciated, distressed, troubled, hated. We feel that deep, deep, deep hurt in our body where our heart is actually broken. You might look like a good person from outside, but in our inside we have this deep pain and sorrow that we are, we are burdened with. You know, that's where I think relationship is. 
You know, a relationship is not a person who would come in a public place like this. A relationship is a person where a family would testify, your spouse would testify, your child would testify of how your relationship, but not a disguised thing that we come to a public and we do a different thing. A relationship is something that your family would be more able to testify what the relationship is. So relationship, as I've explained, it's very important for us in our life. Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, you know, name Abraham and Sarah, there's relationship across all the Bible, right? Except for one person who didn't have a relationship, who did not get married, who was that? In the Bible, he did not marry that one person. God asked him not to marry. Jeremiah is the only person who did not get, have a relationship. But all other people, all other characters in the Bible have a relationship. Let me put a name to this relationship and call one another. How about that? Is that okay? Is it okay if I call a relationship one another because me and another person is one another? That's what is relationship. If you look at the Bible, Bible has 37 references of the word called one another. You'll not find a Probably I, I did not do a, a search on it, but you'll probably not find a word called relationship. But 37 times you will find this word called one another. Myself and my body, myself and my wife, myself and my son, one another. Let me turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. That's where my context will shout. So I just wanted to do a quick icebreaker and see the relationships, how one another is so important for us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 29 through 32. If someone can read that for me, please. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another twice. In this, word, in this chapter itself, it's used twice out of the 37 references I've just mentioned. As God in Christ forgive of you. How many of you know this Sunday school song? Let no corrupt communication proceed off out your mouth, but only doing that is good to help your brothers out. Be kind to one another, tender, compassionate too forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. So there's a song that actually, this context was picked up from my experience. It's not just like I was reading the Bible, but I went through this, um, you know, thing called one another when I was deeply hurt on certain things that have recently happened. And I was asking God, God, what, what should I do with this? You know, what is this all about one another? Um, you know, I can't be happy myself. I have to be happy with my brother. I have to, happy with, I have to be uh, uh, happy with my child, with my coworker, with my spouse. Otherwise, it deeply hurts. I went through this pain for the past three, four weeks. I would say, brothers, some of the brothers know this. So this is something that I've experienced and I want to share with you because I am truly believing that God is going to speak to each one of us this afternoon hour. So let me pull this word called uh, kindness. What does kindness mean? What does kindness mean? Any idea? Give me some examples of what kindness is. Kindness is something you go to a beggar on the street. We were just, you know, taking the left on the golf. And there was this guy uh, who was uh, saying that he wanted a 13.5 shoe size. Uh, he wrote on a, on a placard and my daughter was like, dad, 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 let's go buy him shoes. Um, and, you know, by the time I pulled out my wallet to give a dollar, you know, the signal was there. And it's like, too bad, we couldn't help him. Is that all kindness is? Wherein you go help a person who is in need? That's kindness. Of course, that is kindness. But... Kindness is something more of a, uh, a natural thing that, um, you know, uh, that comes out of, uh, uh, you know, it's an affection. It's an affection that, uh, you know, that we show to one another in a, bro in a brotherly love uh, and also in, uh, in showing off our grace to others. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter uh, 12, verse 10. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Be kindly affectionated to one another with brotherly love. In honoring, preferring one another. Is that? Yes. Be kind to one another. So Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, verse 12 and verse 10 says that 
be kindly affectionated to one another. We have to so show affection to a person who is in need, for a person who is in, in sickness, for a person who is in, in, a, in a financial help, who is a, for a person who is going through some problem in his life from something, you know. We have to be affectionate to that person uh, with brotherly love. You know, sometimes we show affection, but we just show the affection for the sake of doing it. It's not a compulsion that we have to do it, but it has to come out of our heart. It has to come out of our affectionate, you know, it has to come out of our, in, you know, intentions that, you know what, I want to go help this person. And also, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Um, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, put on, therefore, as an elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forgiving, forbearing one another. So Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, they say, the put on the elect of God, um, kindness, humbleness of mind, and meekness. And if you also, also look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, um, charity suffereth long and is kind. You know, as I just explained, you know, charity. Um, kindness is something that we have to taught our children, I would say, even from a young age. Um, the ways we can do it is, as an application part of it is, ch a child, when he's young, he has to learn to share with one another. And as a at the same time, he has to, you know, we have to, as parents, teach how they can be kind to one another, right? One example is, um, as we all do as parents and Sunday school teachers do encourage them is, we take our kids out and explain what it means to have a meal on the table, right? It's not easy. To have a meal on the table takes so much effort. We all know, but, but for a kid, it's all about, you know what, my dad has prepared something on the table or my mom has get something on the table. And they always go with choices, right? Especially my daughter goes with choices. Either a chicken, mutton, fish, egg, prawn, that's it. That's her choices, nothing else. But I, I, I taught her, you know, we all, my, myself and uh, you know, family, we all do that, but we took them to the uh, Feed My Child Starving Children and showed them how a meal is prepared with all these different ingredients wherein people are starving for this one sand biscuit. That's where kindness starts. And now they want to show their piggy banks and put a dollar or a 25 cents, you know, want to help it. That's where kindness starts. You know, we need to induce that to our children even from a young age. So... Lord Jesus Christ was compassionate. He was kind on this earth. And he saw the multitude of people. He was filled with compassion. The Bible says many times that when he saw the multitude, he was filled with compassion. My dear brothers and sisters, that's a spiritual kindness. We have to show kindness to unbelievers. We know that when we see an unbeliever, we have to always think that, okay, this person is, is going to an eternal destruction. We have to show compassion on him. We have to show grace on him. We have to show kindness on him and teach him the word of God or love them in a way that they know or they come to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. So that's where our kindness is. The Lord Jesus Christ showed kindness to us, right? This is a, a vertical bar. What does it show? It shows kindness to the mankind. It shows our Lord Jesus Christ from the heaven. He showed kindness to each one of us. He showed grace. He showed mercy. He showed compassion to us. That's the reason we are all forgiven of our sins. Right? At the same time, the horizontal bar, what does it defect? We have to show kindness to others. That's where, you know, our relationships kick in. We have to show kindness to everybody that I've just mentioned. So think about this. Just because we are shown mercy, we are shown grace, we have to show the same thing to others. Just because our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us from our sins, we have to forgive all of, you know, forgive others of our sin. So the next thing I want to go here is, you know, if you look at this, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Next thing is, I've just meant, you know, touched on the kind to one another, forgiving one another. What does it mean, forgiving one another? The supernatural virtue is forgiveness, right? Sometimes we, as human beings, of course, I do the same thing too. Just because the Bible says uh, we have to forgive, if something happens to us, okay, you know, I've forgiven this. But trust me, you will never erase that thing from your mind. I can guarantee you this. Unless God, you know, puts that, changes your mind, if you have picked a, uh, an argument or a fight with a person or something that you did with a person, the minute you see him, you will remember that. I guarantee you on this. Unless God changes your mind, unless God changes your heart, it's very difficult for a believer to go embrace him and say, even if you embrace him, you'll have that thing in your mind saying that, man, this guy has, has done so much bad to me. But... You know, we have to forgive. Forgiveness is not just forget. You know, people say that forgive and forget. 
But forgiveness is, is not just about forgetting what the incident was, but also making sure that, you know, we, we uh, uh, focus on these things and uh, look at the offenses that we have gone through and then uh, uh, not selfishly but wholeheartedly forgive the person and not just recollect whatever it is, you know, that has happened to us. So Christ forgave us, right? Just because Christ has forgave us, it's our responsibility to uh, forgive, uh, you know, uh, uh, others as we do, uh, uh, you know, when we go through this offensive thing. Uh, turn with me to James chapter 3 and verse 2. James chapter 3 and verse 2. Offenses are a reality in life. You will face it no matter what. You will face offensive uh, for everything in your life. James chapter 3 and verse 2. So we all stumble in something other. We hurt someone. We get hurt by something. We offend someone. We take defensive things sometimes. We get offensive actions certain certain times. And we all do that. But... You know, we all have to stumble and no one is perfect and no one is perfect here. But we have to ask God to give us that attitude wherein we can go um, uh, recompense to, uh, you know, for that. So our Lord Jesus Christ said, how many times should I forgive? Any examples? Once, twice, thrice. How many times? Matthew chapter 18 verse 70 says, seven times 70. That's not a count. You know, it's seven times 70 is not one day. 7 times 70 is not a 365 days thing, but 7 times 70 is just an example where um, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, tells Peter that we have to forgive. Just because our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sins, we have to forgive many times. We might have to do that numerous times, but um, we have to uh, keep that attitude that uh, we have to, Christ forgive me and I have to forgive others as well. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, how should a Christian respond to, uh, respond to an offense, right? You are not guilty of anything. You haven't done a single bit of it. But something happened to you. And you're stuck in the, in the needle, you said, right? You're stuck in the, uh, between a sandwich. You, there's nothing that you have done wrong. But, uh, uh, you know, what should I do? You know, when, when uh, a Christian, uh, is, how should a Christian respond to uh, offenses uh, in his life? James chapter 5 and verse 9 tells us that. James chapter 5 and verse 9, uh, it says that do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is, un is, a judge is standing at the door. So sometimes, you know, uh, when an offense is there, we don't have to grumble. We don't have to sit uh, calm and then, you know, we don't have to really feel bad. You know, when that happens in life, we just have to leave it to God and God will take care of it. Um, Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 17 says that, Repay no one evil to evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of Lord. Right? Have a Christian uh, organization in India... Uh, this is a, 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 ch a Christian ministry church. What they do is, they are called radicals for Christ, right? You might all be thinking that, man, you know, these people is, they're radical Christ, so maybe they are very bold in, in what they're doing. But what they do is, somebody slaps on the right hand or right cheek, they, they do a, a, a slap on the left cheek, and they say that, you know, we are radical for Christ because God has asked us to show one cheek. If, if, if somebody hits you on one cheek, but you want to hit on another cheek. So we have been beaten, 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 beaten again and again. So we want to be radical of Christ. Meaning what they do is they don't beat one another. But what they do is they, they, they repay that somehow or the other. They keep that in our mind saying that if success or somebody comes and does something, they take a revenge of it. And I was pretty astonished by this organization saying that, man, that's not good. That's not good. You take a revenge of it. You know, Romans saying that do not pay evil to evil. But, you know, it says that uh, repay no evil to evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. Sometimes we do that as human beings, right? Right? And if your boss does something, if your co-worker does something, oh, you know what? My co-worker does something to me. You know, I'm going to put some glitches in the code. Let him go through that, 
right? We as human beings, instantaneously, spontaneously, that comes out of our nature that, you know, tick for tack is what you say. Um, back in my childhood days, uh, there used to be a family called uh, Abraham. And um, they used to have two sons. Their two sons are just one year apart. So as they were growing older, they used to pick a fight a lot, actually. They used to fight like crazy. And the older one used to come and say, Dad, you know what? Um, it's uh, Enoch and uh, I don't know the other one's name, but Enoch and uh, um, Joshua, I guess. Uh, Joshua hit me on my cheek. And this dad used to say, go hit him again. I was like, what? Is this, this, is this a dad who is training them to? So what his explanation was, if somebody hurts you, he wants to tell the child that that hurts God gets into pain, that hurts is painful. So if his older brother or the younger brother hits, he'll take, you know, why did he hit you? He'll go hit him on the exact same spot. I was very young, I still remember that. That's not it is. You know, it's not evil for evil, but we have to mean good for something evil that happens. And of course, you know, that was very, you know, that was very young, you know, maybe in my five or six. But I remember this uh, incident wherein, you know, uh, tick for tack is what the father did. We had a silly explanation of it, but I don't want to get into that. But what I'm trying to tell you is, um, we have to mean good to somebody who has, uh, you know, as a Christian, we have to, if you have to respond to an offense. If you are hurt, if you are deeply hurt by something, we have to respond good to them, right? You know, that's where it is. And, um, you know, we pray this Lord prayer, right? What do we pray? Right? What do we pray? Forgive us of our trespasses. I think when we do this, if we don't forgive somebody who is trespassing against us or somebody who is sinning against us, we are lying. You are doing one more sin on top of it. Right? And saying Lord's Prayer, you are sinning again. Then you have to ask for that forgiveness again. So, I know it's hard subject. You know, I, I, I went through this personally speaking that it's not easy to forgive. Uh, and we are hurt in many different ways. So, you know, we have to uh, you know, learn that uh, you know, uh, our Heavenly Father has taught this Lord prayer, forgive us for those who have uh, trespasses uh, against us, right? So, you know, that's where uh, we have to learn that we have to forgive one another. You know, that's the reason Paul, uh, writing to this Ephesians, says that be kind to one another, tender, compassionate to forgiving one another, forgive one another. You know, that's where I think, if you don't forgive, right, think about this. When, when a Christian has an offense, and uh, you, don't, you, you don't forgive and then you keep it in your mind for a long time. You know, the emotional thing that drives you is crazy. That will drive you nuts, I would say. Right? When, you, when something happens and then you think about this, think about this, think about this. Some, some people get up in the night. They can't fall asleep. And if you forgive, trust me, you'll have the peace of mind uh, that, that you, could, you could experience. I'll, I'll tell you this because I've gone through this. Once you go reconcile that with God and reconcile with the person and you have genuinely forgiven him and not that you see him and you recollect that incident, if you are genuinely forgiven that person, you'll have the joy that you will never ever experience in your life. That's, that's something that I want, I encourage everybody to, to practice, you know. Uh, although you might not be at fault, but you have to, you know, go take away that, uh, you know, that thing from your heart, from your mind. So by refusing to forgive, what happens, right? I'll come to the next topic here. By refusing to forgive, you're opening your life up for bitterness. Is that true? Right? If something happens, you refuse to forgive that person, you start having this bitter feeling against him. That's when you start the bitterness. So let me give you the... the you know, uh, acrostic for peace, right? When you have, if you want peace, I want you to write down this one, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Uh, P is uh, pray for the person, right? Pray for the person if you are, uh, you know, that's where you could respond to an offense. Pray for the person is, um, you know, Luke chapter 6 and verse 28, it says that pray for them which despitefully use you or, for, you, know, you know, they, they say false accusation against you. Pray for the person. E is empathize uh, your enemy from a different perspective. You know, not that you want to take an avenge of him, but uh, empathize that person. And P E is a, is the next one. And act, uh, do specific um, good things to uh, that person. 
uh, and love your enemies, bless them, and then, you know, go for a dinner for them and, and do an act of something that you can show that, you know what, I, I really love you, brother. I really love you, sister. So pray for the person, empathize with the person, and then do an act, you know, some act, you know, take some, something to their home and then give, them, give it to their home so you could show that. And then confess, be honest in yourself to admitting any or all responsibility that you share in this incident, right? Be honest in that and confess about what you have done. And then, you know, that's where you can emulate Christ in your nature. P-E-A-C-E. -E. You will get this P-E-A-C -E only if you forgive and not have bitterness in your life. Let me tell you, when you have bitterness, right? Bitterness is very dangerous, my dear brothers and sisters. It's, somebody says that it's like a cancer, right? Uh, I'll tell you why it's, 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 it's so... Uh, dangerous, uh, uh, you know, it is, is uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse uh, 15. I'll tell you why bitterness is so dangerous in our life. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, I want, if it's projected on the screen, I want everybody to look at that carefully and, uh, and kind of an understand two points that I'm going to bring in, in here. So the root of bitterness springs up and causes, what does it cause? Trouble. And by it many are defiled. Right? Bitterness causes us trouble. The opposite of forgiveness is bitterness. If you don't forgive, you have this bitter feeling in your mind. Forgiveness is an attitude that honestly acknowledges the offense and then dismisses it on the basis of God's forgiveness. But if you don't forgive, don't tell me that, you know what, I've forgiven this brother. If you're not forgiven, then you have bitterness. Either one thing can happen. You forgive and then leave it to God. If you did not forgive it, you have a bitterness in your heart. When you have a bitterness in your heart, that's when you are causing trouble. Let me tell you some examples wherein you have bitterness uh, in the Bible. Cain and Abel, what happened? They bought offerings, right? Cain bought all the burnt offerings, Right? Both of them bought the offerings and uh, whose offerings was accepted? Abel's was accepted. What happened to Cain? Cain got bitter. He got resented in his mind. And then as an act of it, what did he do? He killed his brother. So he got in trouble. If you have bitterness, I'm not saying that we are all murderers, but even as a sin that you think about your brother is a bitter thing, then you are in trouble. Then you have Cain and Abel. Abel wouldn't have, or rather Cain wouldn't have thought that he would kill his brother just for the offering, but he ended up doing it, right? That's one example I can give you. Um, what happened to Joseph and the brothers, right? The brothers were so jealous about his uh, Joseph, they were bitter against him, they resented him, and then they sold him. Did uh, Jacob take revenge on that? No, he wouldn't have. He had every single opportunity as uh, the top uh, management guys. He could have taken every single responsibility to take the revenge on the brothers. But did he do that? No, he didn't do that. He, leave it, he left it to God. And um, all the brothers did realize that, and then they, they turned back. And if you look at uh, Leah and uh, Rachel, you know that example, right? Um, turn with me to that scripture. It's, it's a wonderful one. Uh, Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. I'm going to read one verse here. Verses uh, 31 onwards. So, when the Lord saw that Leha was eight, he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. So here, if you see, Leah was, uh, she, she uh, was having this hatred. She was having this bitterness. If you see the names of uh, some of the, the tribes of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jacob, you will see that these are all like some of them are, uh, you know, God has judged me. And then uh, uh, with mighty wrestling, I've wrestled with my sister and I prevailed and Nephtali. So, you know, there was, there was bitterness here. You know, in this incident, uh, there was, uh, uh, Leah was uh, bitter uh, and then she started because she was not able to conceive. And uh, same thing with Abraham and Sarah. Sarah could not conceive. And what did uh, uh, Sarah do? She said, like, okay, well, go with uh, my maidservant, Hagar, 
And she was bitter because Hagar was conceived. She was bitter against Hagar. And as a, as a result, was, is there trouble or not? Right? You will see that there's a trouble, right? What is the trouble? All our Muslim brothers and sisters. Ishmael. There was trouble. When you have hatred, when you have bitterness, and uh, one more example I would like to give you, um, Saul and David. Uh, when Saul and David went and fought, uh, Saul uh, killed 1,000, David killed 10,000. There was a huge rally wherein David was praised. People worshipped him. Uh, they, they, you know, uh, they sung uh, or they praised the king uh, or David. What happened? All of a sudden, Saul started hating. He has bitter feeling. He resented David. And then as an act of it, he wanted to kill David every time he saw it. He could not forgive. If he had forgiven, then I think the Bible would have had a different twist. But, you know... Paul, uh, sorry, uh, uh, King Saul was so bitter against David because of its, uh, you know, uh, of the praise and the, 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 the warrior and whatever is shown in the field. Um, when, when David uh, was celebrated for his accomplishment, Saul resented David and wanted to kill him with a spear. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 19 says that, you know, Saul wanted to kill him. Um, Job is an, another example, right? What has happened? You know, Job says his wife and their children said, curse God and die. They were bitter. They were angry. They were, they were hatred. And, uh, you know, even there, um, you know, Job 2 and 9 says that, uh, um, do you still hold fast your integrity, curse God and die? There was bitterness in there. All these examples I've shown you where I had bitterness. Even in the, in the New Testament, right, all the Pharisees and the scribes, they were bitter against the acts of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Lord Jesus Christ were doing miracles, they were bitter. Right? That's the reason, you know, they, they wanted to crucify him. They wanted to um, give into the hand of the, uh, the pilot. But I'll tell you one example. One example who didn't have bitter. Any, any guesses? Who took it very positively when they were in trouble? Who took it very positively and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go with you wherever you go. Who is that person? Yeah, there you go, Ruth. Right? You know that, right? Ruth, uh, you know, Naomi, uh, you know, she comes uh, from this uh, land of Moab to, the, to the Bethlehem because there was, uh, 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 you know, there was uh, this whole, uh, um, what you call this, uh, uh, there was famine in the land of Moab. And, um, you know, she comes along with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Naomi comes along with uh, her two sons uh, into the land. And then the two sons uh, die. And then what happens is once the two sons die, they, uh, you know, the, the first one, let me, uh, Ruth chapter uh, 2. Yeah, Ruth chapter 1 and uh, verse 16, all the chapter, right? So um, there was this, um, you know, Ruth uh, along, uh, you know, in the book of, uh, the, there was famine and then from Bethlehem, Elimelech and his wife Naomi with their two sons, um, you know, uh, Malhon and Chilion, they immigrated to this land called Moab. And uh, Elimelech died, um, you know, the, the wife of uh, Naomi, she died, and then uh, her two sons got married to Ruth and Oprah. Uh, when they got married, uh, apparently the two sons died also, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 4 says that, wherein uh, both the sons died. And uh, what did Naomi say? Naomi said to this daughter-in-law, say that, you know, go to your land, uh, return to Bethlehem. Uh, she said, return to your own countries with your mother and go remarry. But uh, uh, Orpah, what she did, she reluctantly left. She said like, okay, well, you know what, here is a good chance, let me slip away. She went back to their mother, mother-in-law or mother, and then I don't know whatever happened after that. But Ruth said an interesting thing, Ruth chapter 1. I want you to read that for me. Uh, Ruth chapter 1. Verses uh, 16 and 17. If somebody has that uh, scripture, if you could read. Ruth. So if you look at this, Ruth, uh, you know, if you look at the previous verse, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clinged her to her. But um, see what she said, do not urge me to leave uh, you or to return 
from following you. For your, where you go, I will go. For where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and where you uh, and I where I will be buried. May the Lord do uh, so to me, and more also, if anything, but death aparts parts free from you. What an amazing love, right? Mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, right? You know, Oprah, she probably was bitter. She was angry because, you know, she bought this, uh, uh, she had married and then now she, they, they came to Bethlehem because of the famine and the uh, husband, father-in-law died and now the son died and I don't know, whatever happened, Bible doesn't record all those things of why they died, but she had, she was angry probably and she just fled away. But Ruth, amazingly, you know, she said like, you know, uh, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Unless death can separate each one of us, uh, you know, I'm not going to leave you. What an amazing testimony, right? Contrary to the other examples where we see that Ruth, out of that genealogy, we see whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Out of the genealogy of Ruth and, and David, we saw our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm trying to tell my dear brothers and sisters is, if you have bitterness, bitterness gets into trouble. Bitterness gets into deep, deep trouble that you might not probably see it right away, but I'll tell you it's going to bike us back. It, it, it's going to uh, um, uh, take us back pretty, pretty alarmingly, and you will not even know how you do it. You know, you might fall. You might sometimes, you know, uh, it, 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 just, it just pulls you down. It just pulls you down physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is. You know, you break up relationships. And, um, you know, when we, when we um, really use the, the bitterness, right, sometimes our bitterness just comes out spontaneously from our mouth, right? We, we instinctively, you know, when something happens, when we are offended, when we have something, uh, when, there's, when there's this thing that uh, you want to you show that natural feeling, feeling of anger, right? Um, but let me uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter... Uh, Matthew, what comes out of our heart? We, it's okay to get, uh, it's okay to get uh, angry, uh, Matthew chapter 15 and uh, verses uh, 10, I'm going to read that for you. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And you know, if you read it, uh, you know, it keeps on saying that what you eat, um, you know, will pass into the mouth and into the stomach and it's expelled. But what comes out of your mouth proceeds from the heart and it defiles the person. From out of the heart comes evil thoughts, adultery, murder, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. There's a reason if you see, uh, see Ephesians chapter 4, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. If you are bitter, if you are angry, if you are distressed, eventually one act of that is you show your frustration. You speak something out of your mouth. And what comes out of your mouth is what defiles the person. Right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? You might, you, might, you might do all sorts of polished uh, speaking, right? If you work in the, in the, in the IT sector, right, um, you will never even understand that you have a problem with your coworker. Trust me, they are more diplomatic. They are very diplomatic. Than, uh, we Indians are not like that. You know, we are more of a plain and straightforward people most of the time. But, uh, you know, sometimes if you work with someone, you will never even understand that, man, can this person really do this to me? We went for lunch, we went to parties, we, we ate together, we are lunch buddies or whatever, but you know, uh, you know sometimes it's, it's um, you know, what comes out of uh, the attitude of your mouth actually is defiles. You know, James chapter three, it says that, treat your tongue like, a, 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 like an ornament. I want you to read that. Nalukanu nagaduga vaduka galute, padukadu prapanchamu. I think it's a very good verse. I want you to read that, uh, taming of tongue. Um, James chapter 3, and if anybody has a Telugu one, I want you to read that. Naluka Adiyoka Padu Prapanchuan onto that actually. Oksa Chalavande, Telugu on that late. I want somebody to read that uh, verse for me. It's in James chapter 3, and I don't know which verse it is, but okay, I want you to read in Telugu, please.
So look at this examples. It's a deadly poison and uh, it causes fire by hell. Uh, it's kind of a, a reptile, sea creations, and can be uh, tamed with the mankind. So, you know, a sister has read, um, tongue can really cause a lot of damage. Right? Some people tell you, they will not know what they are doing. Why do you know? Why do you know? Why do you know what they are doing? Why do you know what they are doing? ఈ మాట్లాడతారు తెలియదు చిన్నపిల్లలు ఉన్నారు తెలియదు పెద్దలు ఉన్నారు తెలియదు ఆడవాళ్ళు ఉన్నారు తెలియదు ఏం తెలియదు నోట్లో వచ్చేదంతా పచ్చిబూతులు అందుకే ది ఐ రిమెంబర్ దోస్ డేస్ బ్యాక్ ఇన్ మై డోస్ యునో వెన్ వీ యూస్ టు గో టు ద విలేజ్ మై డాడ్ యూస్ టు సే యునో డోంట్ గో విత్ దిస్ వన్ పర్సన్ యూస్ టు సే ఐ డోంట్ నో వై ఐ నెవర్ అండర్స్టాండ్ వై ఈ సెట్ దాట్ వంత ఒక్కంత పోకరాను అనేటోడు ఎవరితో నువ్వు అంత ఒక్కతో పోడరా అనేది ఎందుకంటే వీ నోడు తెరిస్తే పచ్చిబూతులు andike what what bible says is right what comes out of your mouth is very important i'm not saying that you can you can use bad language or harsh language but tongue is very important for each one of us right let no corrupt communication i will say lord let no corrupt communication so uh, in the abundance of the words there is no one false is what the bible says if you keep talk some people talk a lot actually uh, and when when i got married in the first time i was always a, a person who was who never used to talk a lot actually i was i was more of a answer to the question and just get along that's it and uh, contrary to that my wife used to talk a lot right she used to call all her cousins and then you know em tinaru em pankunaru ekka pankunaru ba 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 yani avasava yi anni anpichindi naagithe but sometimes i'm not saying that that's good or bad but even today if i call my parents i'll say hey dad how are you doing hey mom how are you doing take your tablets did you eat lunch did you eat dinner uh what time did you sleep what year did you get up finish five points and my mom sees vadu peddodu call chesina podu rendu nimshal kante ekku matladu chinnodu aithe chaalse matladtadu i don't know maybe what else can i ask i can maybe ask couple things like max of 5 6 7 8 10 minutes that's it but contrary to that my sister she can talk for hours together i can trust tell me uh, trust me my my sister she will talk for at least an hour in a day um during a recess time and in the evening time and and what i'm saying is uh, it's not bad to talk is what i'm saying but sometimes in the in the fluency of the word we commit mistakes sometimes you know um, we as indians right we you know people call us as bbcs why you know what you know what bbc is no no clues no british british broadcasting corporation why because we always like to talk about another person we always like to talk what is happening in their family what is happening in their children what is happening in their houses it's it's you can talk i'm not saying you should not i'm not saying you should not talk but as long as you pray for that person as long as you intercede for their problems before christ as long as you have the spiritual nourishment with that family as long as you go talk counsel pray you know uh, and and know their problems know their shortfallings know their mistakes or know whatever is their family is i'm i'm you know god will always be on your side if you talk but if you're just talking it for the sake of um you know just knowing and some people feel better in talking i'll tell you why pakkanonki problem vachindante amma naaku ledhu kada ani feel ayipey chaala santosham untukuntaru you know uh, edward anna used to say onida advertisement right um, so you know when we talk we have to be careful we have to tame our tongue because tongue is is very dangerous it creates fires between mother and daughter it creates fires between brother in law and sister in law mother in law daughter in law it creates fire in all relationships if you don't tame a tongue right so there's a reason paul writing to the ephesians said church saying that let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth but do only that is you know uh, that will bring glory you know that's ephesians chapter 4 it's it says that uh, you know let's let's we have to keep a, a control on what we speak what we talk um you know and what and what 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 comes out of you know sometimes we just we just get excited and then we talk about it but um, you know end of the day we realize that hey, you know what probably i shouldn't have asked that question i shouldn't have talked like that so you know uh, what what is very important is as james writing to the um, to this um, you know in this chapter saying that taming of a tongue you know it's uh, it's it brings lot of judgment lot of lot of problems you know um thank you today i can talk about it for hours together on the problems that it can create but i'm going to stop here but turn back to turn your bibles to uh, ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 uh, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth 
but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it might give grace those to hear. Man, what an amazing verse it is, right? But talk only that which is good for building up and fits the occasion. And fits the occasion and also give grace to those who hear, right? Uh, I used to have uh, a roommate in uh, Arizona. Uh, you know, we, I was, uh, when I came to U.S., I was working in McKesson Corporation, and I used to have a roommate. This guy, if he talks, his frequency was so high. You know, Kanchu, Kanchu Martla na Tantra Gada. So he used to talk, Mahabul Gana Martla Tori, he never used to shout or, or raise his voice, but even his natural language used to, I used to lock myself, we were, you know, we were sharing, uh, we used to share uh, a bedroom. Uh, and then he used to talk so loud, trust me, he was, he, even if he goes out into the balcony and talks, I feel as if he is next to me. Right? So I'm not saying that it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a natural thing that some people have a higher frequency. Uh, but what I'm telling you is, uh, you know, we have to talk uh, for the occasion, right? And he used to talk um, so much and uh, talk about all the subjects. And eventually I stayed with this guy for about three to four months. I knew every single thing that happened in his family. I did not actually pay attention to any conversation that he said, but he used to talk so loud, so loud that, you know, I, I almost knew, uh, you know, that he was engaged, I was getting engaged, and his mom was coming, his dad was coming, uh, and, and you know, sometimes, you know, we just have to see our occasions, too. we have to see who is around us. If it, if it benefits, um, you know, around building up, uh, as it says here, uh, and for the occasion, you know, building up for the occasion, also give grace, grace in our talk. Some people talk so stubbornly, you can make it out from their body language, right? Hello, brother, and hi. You can make it out, because this person doesn't want to respond, doesn't want to show grace. And even if you talk, 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 he will never respond. I have uh, a recent incident wherein I'm trying to get hold of a person. I leave him voice message, I leave him text messages, I leave him phones, five, six, seven, eight times, never responds. And he's not one of uh, 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 a friend, but he's, he's very close, but I don't know what is happening. And myself and my wife were praying about it and let's say, you know what, let's go talk to them. Let's build an occasion and let's, let's go find out what is happening. So what I'm saying is, uh, as, an, as a practical example here, if you're going through bitterness, if you have some harsh thing against your brother or your friend or some relationship or some one another, I would encourage you to go talk to that person. If you talk, You'll, you'll solve most of the problems, right? Instead of solving, what we do is, we take this one, take it to your parents, take it to their parents, take it to your in-laws, their in-laws, they will talk, and you are not involved, they do something, and then all of a sudden, it's all trouble. Messy, 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 hypothesis. Then you'll eventually realize that, man, I caused so much damage. Have you experienced that any time? You just pick an example and then, you know, oh, he'll take something, he'll add more to it, and he'll take something, he'll add more to it, and then by the time it, uh, you know, uh, that's the reason it says that gossip ends with a wise person. Have you heard that? Gossip ends with a wise person, because if you hear about something, it, as it fits the occasion, we have to talk. If it's not fitting the occasion, you just pause it right there. Uh, and trust me, this is an experience that I'm, I'm speaking right now. And God has taught to me through these examples over the past three, four weeks. Uh, and there's a reason it says, uh, we have to tame your tongue and uh, talk only that is good for building up as it fits the occasion. So we have grace to those you hear. We have to uh, show that grace as well. So, yeah, we talked about all these things. What next? Brother, you have taught me to be kind. You have taught me to be, you know, to have a forgiving nature. And uh, you have taught me to, you know, uh, tame the tongue and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, talk what is, uh, uh, what is beneficial to others. I'll give you one simple formula. Remove, replace. Copy, cut, remove, replace. Right? I'll tell you what you have to remove. It's in the Bible. I'm not making it up. If you go to the previous wife, previous words, uh, the new life, it says uh, it's already there, but I want to make it more simplified. So I'm just um, telling this as remove something and replace it with. I'll tell you what you have to remove. Bitterness is something I've just explained. You have to remove it. Uh, uh, and slammer, outward acts of violence, anger, a deep, subtle feeling of sin, evil speaking, which are examples of slander, criticism, gossip, malice, uh, hatred on the inside, wrath, a wild spread of rage. And according to Paul, 
all these things have to be removed. It's already here in the chapter, uh, you know, in the verse. Uh, you have to take away the old self, uh, which belongs to the former men of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Uh, and then, you know, it's, uh, and then put on the new life. So the list I've just mentioned, remove. Remove bitterness, remove anger, remove hatred, remove false accusations, remove scandals, criticisms, gossip, all these things. I mean, these are more of a natural things that, that comes out of a human being. And brother, yes, brother, we got the list. What should we replace with? Don't replace bitterness with bitter. Don't replace malice with something else. So it has to be replaced with tender heart, a heart that shows grace, a God to those compassion, the opposite of being hard uh, hearted person, uh, opposite of feeling uh, unfeeling and refusing, um, and then to understand one another's feeling or circumstances. Um, and if you will remove all bitterness, wrath, anger, and then put on this new self, take away the old self, put on this new self, what happens is, uh, you know, if it says, uh, uh, put on, and you'll have uh, verse uh, 21. Yeah, verse 21, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 21. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to your former uh, man, former manner of life and is corrupted through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new self is something that we can't replace it so easily. It's, it's a tough thing to take away all those remote things that I've mentioned and replacing it with new things. You can only do that, you know, uh, with the help of our Holy Spirit. You know, that's the reason it says that when we do certain things, we don't only grieve one another, but we grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed by the day of redemption. So you might be wondering, what, what's wrong with, uh, you know, having harsh words with my brother or my sister? Or what happens, right? So you don't only, not only grieve that one another, not only grieve the person, but you grieve the Holy Spirit in doing that. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you've gone through this. You need to replace, or uh, you need to renew, remove all those, you know, bad practices greedy natures and impurities, I would call it, and replaced with the desires of Christ Jesus and desires of the new life created after the likeness of God. When you have a new life, you will have the likeness of God and in true righteousness, holiness, right? So let this be true that uh, God might give us uh, a tender heart. God might give us a heart that we can understand from another person. God might give us words that encourage others. God might give us words that, that build up families, not destruct families. God might give us the word that encourages uh, people to come closer to God, to build, um, build up as it fits to the occasion, right? And God might give us that subtle nature. You know, we have to be calm in spirit, but at the same time, we have to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. The application part is, I want you to start practicing this. You know, sometimes we come in here, and we go back and uh, we don't really understand what the word is, but I want you to take one example this week. We all have somebody we are bitter against. Uh, somewhere or the other, if you don't have, ask God, God, is there something that I'm bitter against? I don't talk to this person, right? I don't talk to a person in the church. Maybe you have a person that you never want to talk. I'll say, you know what? Right? And then, first list for Rasi. I've told you that peace, right? I told you the acrostatic for peace. Try doing that, right? Go to him, talk to him, show an act, and, uh, you know, take something and, and talk to him. Even if that person says, you know, you know, even if that person says, don't ever show your face, some people say that, don't ever show your face to me, if your, if your son or daughter gets angry, you don't Right? My wife always used to say, No, Pillan Gadishna Pudu, Kunsa Bulpetalni. My daughter, if she is upset, she'll say, mm, and she goes upstairs, lock in the room. Within five minutes, I'll go. Right? Nimokanju Petu Kandam. So her, her thing is, don't show your face, means she'll sing, okay, I'll meet, let me run to my room, and she'll hide her face. Same example. I'm thinking it might be really sounding simple, but. You might have circumstances or situations in life saying that, you know what, 
Don't show your face to me because you've taken a, a different religion altogether. Don't show your face to me because you did this. Don't show your face to me because you did not obey the word of God or whatever, right? Take that one person, I would encourage you to do that. Take that one person, put it on your Bible, take a pluck card, put it on the Bible, write that one name and pray for that person every day. Show some act. There might be a person that you did not sp speak to years. I had one brother, not a, not a far brother, who is my dad's brother. I did not talk to him for five, six years because of an incident that happened in my house. And God really spoke to me saying that you have to go talk to him. And uh, thank God I did that. Uh, for the first time when I went to uh, US after, uh, when I went to India after coming here, I went and talked to him saying that, Baba, I did that, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I was very aggressive when I was in my youth. And uh, there might be one person, you know, if you don't have a person, ask God to show. You know, he will show you that one person. I'm not saying that you should have. If you don't have any, praise God. Right? Brother Nagy, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a easygoing guy. I have no bitterness against anybody. And I praise God for that. But if you have somebody who you don't, whom you don't talk to, ask God, God, show me that one person that I don't talk to. And God will show you that person and pray for that person. Pray for the person and, you know, once you start praying and then showing that act and confess before, uh, you know, whatever offense that was, that was caused or incident that of God, leave it to the feet of Jesus and pray about it. And trust me, you will feel a fullness of joy that you'll never even understand. And you will see it, experience, you will experience it, not like writing theory papers, you know, that, that you know, sometimes we, we, uh, we have to go through that practical thing. Um, so that will be the application of it. Uh, and then show kindness. Uh, forgive that person. And uh, I, want, I want you to take this few minutes, Evan, as we pray and uh, conclude the message. Heavenly Father, talk, thank you for speaking to each one of us. Yes, Lord, oh, Father, the old nature is always